right, back to Genesis. Back to Genesis chapter 1. I am sure that you have heard of... Grab this quick. I'm sure that you have heard of the group PETA before. Anybody ever heard of the group PETA? People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. I want to go ahead and say that they're uh, an organization that I think has done some good in a few ways when you come to maybe slaughtering practices and agriculture and that type thing. But their whole thing normally is that any consumption of animals is wrong. Any use of animals is wrong. They fight what they call animal cruelty, which we should fight as well, but they really go beyond that. Last week, PETA tweeted something, and they used a new term. It's a term I'd never heard before, and the term was speciesism. So you've got sexism, you've got racism, and now we have speciesism. And this is what PETA said. They said that words make a more inclusive world or perpetuate oppression. Calling someone an animal is an insult reinforces the myth that humans are superior to other animals and justified in violating them. Stand up for justice by rejecting uh, the speciesism or the supremacist language. So this is what they say. Don't call people chickens. Call them cowards. Don't call people rats. Call them snitches. Uh, Don't call people a snake. Call them a jerk. Well, Jesus would have a little bit of a problem with that because he called the Pharisees vipers, and uh, he used that picture intentionally. Don't call people a pig. Call them repulsive. And then finally, don't call people sloths. Call them lazy because we just got to make sure we don't hurt the sloths' feelings when it comes down to it. They said in there, though, that there is a myth that humans are superior to animals. Is that true, that that is a myth? Essentially what they're saying is that animals and humans are equal in every way, and that any thought that human beings are superior to animals is something that is made up and that is a myth. Is that true, or are we different? And if we are different, how do we know as human beings that we are different? And what does that mean for us? What does the Bible tell us to think about this? Well, Genesis chapter 1 tells us that we are different. And this is very, very important on many levels today when you think about where our culture is, how we view life, how we view gender and sexuality, how we uh, view other people even people that we disagree with. So let's pick up in Genesis 1, and then we'll begin in verse 26. This is the sixth day after God has created all the animals on the land. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was an evening, and there was a morning, the sixth day. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy 
because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. A big thought that you can take home from this today is this. We are created to reflect God's glory on his earth. As human beings, you, me, all of humanity were originally created to reflect God's glory on this earth. Let's pray and ask the Lord to teach us from his word today. Father, I ask that you would teach us, that you would fill me with your spirit, protect me from my opinions, and help me to speak only the truth that's found here in your word. Fill me with your spirit and your power to proclaim the excellency of your truth and then to point people to the grace that is in Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name and for his glory. Amen. Last week, we looked at God's sovereign power over creation. The Bible began with God, and human beings didn't have anything to do with it. And we'd actually gotten to the point to where all of the universe had been created. All of the earth had been created. Everything was in place except for one thing. God had not yet created man. The land animals were there, but God had saved the best for last, some people have said, have said that God crowned creation with man. And when you look at this here, you can definitely see that man is different from the rest of creation. And there are uh, three main ways that he is different from the rest of creation that are very important for us to understand. When you look at Genesis chapter 1, in the creation of man, we see first of all that man's creation was personal. It was personal to God. Look at verse 26 and how God says this. In verse 26, God says, Let us make man in our image. Every creative act before this had begun with, Let there be, and then it would happen. But in this instance, God changes the formula and He says, Let us, speaking of Himself, Let us make man in our image. This isn't said anywhere else in the account of creation. God is taking this to another level. Man and God are about to be personally linked in a way that the animals aren't. Now, there's something interesting here that we, we have to look at. Did you notice the plural in this? God, singular, said, let us, us, Make man in our image. Now, sitting here 2,000 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we see the fullness of what our and us meant there. What do I mean by that? Well, if you were to go to John chapter 14, verse 17, and then verse 23, Jesus is talking there. He talks about the Holy Spirit. He is going to come. And then he says later on, we... Speaking of Him, the Father, and the Spirit are going to minister to believers. You have the Father, Son, and you have the Holy Spirit there. We call this the Trinity. We see this even clearer later on in Matthew 28. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, at this point, I don't think that we can say that this was a definite proof for the Trinity at this point. It wasn't. You can call this, in Genesis chapter 1, a seed. Just just a truth that's out there that makes room for the Trinity or the knowledge of the Trinity later on. God, singular, said us and our. It's a a hint, if you will, about things that we're going to learn as we continue through this. Man's creation was personal. God had not said this about the animals, but he says it about himself. Let's make man in our image. Then we see that man's creation was patterned. Man's creation was patterned. What do we mean by that? Well, look at verse 26 again. Let us make man in what? Our image. There are some people who would translate the Hebrew here also, and we'll talk more about this in a moment, as let us make man as our image. And that's going to be important when you think about the rest of this. God says, let's make man in our image. Let's make man in our likeness. Those words image and likeness are synonymous. This word image and likeness has the idea of a relief. 
You know what a relief is? It's something where you carve out so that something stands out and you can then begin to make an image out of it. So in, in those days, they had a lot of reliefs. There would be somebody who would carve an image of a king and it was supposed to reflect them. It was a sculpture of sorts. God is saying, let's carve man out in our image. Now, when we think about this, This is reflecting something. This image is supposed to reflect something that is real. This idea of us being carved out, made in the likeness of God, there is a term that we use for this. It's called the Imago Dei, the image of God. You're going to hear me say that that phrase numerous times. And if you're ever reading an article, it is a term that is used over and over in in theological writing that refers to us being made in God's image. The imago Dei, the image of God. Whatever this is, this is not said of animals. Animals are not imago Dei. Animals are not the image of God. So what does this mean? Does it mean physical resemblance? Last night at supper, we were talking about this talking about the sermon a little bit today, and uh, I can't remember how it came up, but I think I asked the kids, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And one of them, I won't say who, Jay, said uh, something along the lines of, God takes his face, and it's like, uh, we have a face like God would have a face. Now, is, is is that what it means to be made in the image of God? Well, I don't know. We think about what the Scripture says. The Scripture says that God is a spirit and that those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It really wasn't until Jesus took on flesh, took on humanity, that you could say God had any human form whatsoever. So, biblically, to be made in God's image doesn't mean that we physically resemble Him. It means something else. It means that we reflect God's image. As the image of God, the Imago Dei, we are God's image on earth. What does that mean? Well, let's break it down this way. We reason with our intellect. All of these are attributes of God that He gave mankind. We reason with our intellect. It's not like a flying squirrel that can jump off a branch and then calculate what it needs to do with its tail to make sure it lands in the right place. It's not that. It's that we can think, I want to go on a trip to the other side of the country. I need to book a hotel. I need to buy clothes. I need to wash clothes. I need to pack deodorant. I need to change the oil in the car. I need to save money. We are able to reason and we are able to, uh, to, to uh, reason from our intellect in ways that animals can't and in ways that animals don't. Animals, you can put it this way. I want to make a new verb. Animals' instinct. They live by instinct. Man thinks and reasons like God. This is one way that we're made in the image of God that the animals aren't. Here's another way that we're made in the image of God that the animals aren't. We create... Now, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, birds make nests, spiders make webs, and and they're these beautiful webs. Yes, they do those things, and yes, they create those things, but understand they create those things by instinct because that's all spiders do is make webs. That's all birds do is make nests. Spiders don't think, you know what would be really nice? If I could electrify this web in some way, to where whatever landed in it would immediately be fried. And then uh, spiders aren't thinking, maybe I could make a little small bug microwave to cook my food before I eat it. We create in a way that the animals don't create. Man has taken natural resources and created and improved. And this is the way that we're made in the image of God. We're going to see in just a moment that this is one of the things that God wants us to do. He put us here as image bearers to be like Him. And one of those things is to create. Another thing that man does, is, or another thing that man is, is he is spiritual. We are aware of God. We, we seek God. It's not said in Romans, 
It's not said in Romans that the animals can look around at creation and see that there is a God so that they're without excuse. It's man that can look around and say, God did this. And, and, and so we are spiritual and that we can do something that animals can't do. We can commune with God. Commune as friend with friend. You know, Adam and Eve, when they walked in the garden, we'll see this later on, when they walked in the garden every day, what were they doing? They were fellowshipping with God. And that is because we have a spirit, and we have a soul, and we're able to communicate with God on that spiritual level. The other thing that mankind is, we are moral. Man is moral. What do we mean by moral? And this goes along with intellect, but it goes deeper than that. Listen, lions never worry about the morality of killing another lion who is challenging them. Pit bulls never worry about the morality of whether I should attack this person or not. They're not sitting there and reasoning, saying, is this right? Is this wrong? Is this sinful in some way? Is it wrong for me to steal? <laughs> There's no animal that's ever thought, is it wrong for me to steal? What do they do? They just do it. So humans are moral in ways that animals aren't. Man has God's image, and God has elevated us above creation. Now, the final proof for us having God's image and us being different than the animals is actually found later on in Genesis 9, verse 6. In Genesis 9, verse 6, God says this, that if a man kills another man, his life will be required of him. Turn over there. I want you to see this. This is really important. Just a few chapters over. Genesis 9, verse 6. God does not say this about animals. This is not true. If a man kills an animal, this is not true. This is only true if man kills a man. Verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of a man, and we're talking about someone who is innocent, murder essentially. Whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man what? In his own image. God takes us being image bearers very seriously when we kill another human being without justification. That is a crime against God because God created man in His image. He created man to glorify Him. This is really important as we continue through this because it tells us that we should esteem all human beings as those who are made in God's image. We should esteem all human beings as the Imago Dei. This means that Jesus takes this even further later on in the Gospels when He says we should love our neighbor as ourself. We take care of our animals. There's a stewardship there. We're never told to love our animals the way we love ourselves, though some people do. <laughs> We are told to love our neighbor the way that we love ourselves. I think it's very important in these days when we are so polarized politically, when we are so polarized in so many ways, for Christians to step back and say, wait a minute, that person that I'm saying those nasty things about, while they might be sinning, while they might be wrong, they are created in the image of God. And I need to be careful how I relate to them because they are the image bearer of God. Man's creation was patterned after God. We reflect God's image. We also see that we reflect God's unity. Notice what God says here. Go back to Genesis 1 and back to verse 26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the sea. Go down to verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. He created them male and female. This means, y'all, this is really controversial today, all right? That means God created men 
and God created women, that's it. And He created men, if I mess this up, I'm not a science major, created men with two X chromosomes, and He created women with an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Did I flip that? I wrote it down wrong. (laughs) There are only two chromosome combinations, let's put it that way. Men, XY, women, XX. There we go. And, And biologically, that is true. This was intentional by God. He created two genders on purpose because he says later on, remember we created in the image of God, he says later on, we'll see this later on in chapter 2, that man and woman, the two of them, will become one flesh. Now again, when God originally created man, I think that we have, I know that we have a hint at the Trinity, where you can have three who can be one. And God is saying when man was originally created, you had two who could become one. And I understand that man is fundamentally different than the Trinity. Again, this is just a small picture of the unity of God. Both male and female, we see here, are made in the image of God. And I think we need to be very careful up front here as we look at this. God says he created male and female in his image. That means that both are image bearers of God and are due equal esteem and worth. Any human being is made in that image, male, female, from the unborn at conception to the old. The innocent should thus be protected as God's image bearers. I'll even be so, so, so bold to say is something I heard this week. Souls are worth more than all of the earth because souls are made in the image of God. The rest of the earth is not made in the image of God. So we reflect God's image. We reflect God's unity. And finally, here, we reflect God's rule. We reflect God's rule. Now, in ancient times, and this even still happens today, if you were to go to a communist country, you're going to find pictures of the dear leader all over the place. In ancient times, kings used to make idols of themselves. They used to make sculptures of themselves. And they would put them all throughout their kingdoms as a reminder to all those people that that kingdom belongs to who? To them. It's very interesting that God creates man, and in creating man, he told him to rule over the earth. And in essence, what God is doing here is he's creating man, and he's spreading us all over the earth. He's telling us to fill the earth and to multiply all over the earth. And so in creating man in his image, God is saying, this is my reign all over the earth. You are my representatives, man. You are my ambassadors on this earth. You are made in my image. A lady named Sharon James said this, the invisible God would be represented on earth in visible human form. Man and woman and their descendants would manage the earth on God's behalf for His glory. Now, what we see in this passage though is, yes, man is made in God's image, but man wasn't just put here to exist. Man's creation was for a purpose. Man's creation was for a purpose. Look at verse 27. Verse 27, God says, um, back in verse 26, After our likeness, let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven. Go down to verse 28. God blessed them and God said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice some key words in there. You've got the word dominion which means to take control of, to fill. And God is telling us to fill the earth with other image 
bearers. You have the word subdue. The word subdue has the idea of harnessing or mastering. See, God is sovereign. He rules over the entire earth, but He has delegated the rule of the earth to man. And man is to use that rule of the earth for God's glory. We call this the creation mandate. God has told us as human beings to go harness and to subdue the earth. And we know that this is for His glory. So we create, we harness, we learn. And that is a reflection of God's image and His purpose for us. Man has harnessed the laws of nature. Think of aerodynamics. What law is it that holds us to the earth? I know this science. Gravity. It's what holds us to the earth. But man has overcome that law by discovering another law that God created, the law of aerodynamics. God created us to learn that and to do that. Man has, has, uh, through chemistry, harnessed so much of the earth. We've gone down to the atomic level and been able to harness that. Medicine. The things that we've been able to do with medicine... These are all things that God intended for us to do. And I believe with all of my heart that when when man learns something new in line with the creation mandate, that that is something that pleases God. I put that law there, and they've discovered that. They've used their talents... Now, it's sad when man discovers those things and doesn't give God the glory that he is due. It's even better when someone maps the human genome, the man who did that as a believer, and gives God the glory for that. Electricity. We've harnessed electricity. And and all of these are things that we can do that can bring glory uh, glory to God. See... Subduing the earth and having dominion over the earth is more than simply caring for the world. We are to harness the latent potential that God built into His very good created design in order to magnify the order of His creation, in order to magnify the beauty and capability that God has made us to do. Think about this, all right? I want to show you some pictures here. I know they don't show up super great in here. God created that. That is a large um, uh, cloud of gas in space. Absolutely spectacular. Something that was created all the way back at the beginning of creation. Look at this. God also created the moon. And this is what the earth looks like from space. Did you know that for thousands of years, man had no idea what the earth looked like from space? We, had, we did not have a bird's eye or a moon's eye view of the earth. This is Jupiter. The, the, the detail is crazy. And for thousands of years, man could just see that or could not see that because all we had was what? Our naked eye. I think I've got one more picture on here. This, this is a spiral galaxy. So many light years away from us, we can never dream of reaching it. It doesn't even have a name. It's like M951 or something. And that galaxy has trillions of stars in it. A galaxy that we never saw for thousands of years, unseen for all of human history, but man using God's laws now sees it. We learn how to use radio telescopes. We learn how to create telescopes. And now we can look up and we can see these things. And when we see this, those things have been sitting there singing praise to God for thousands of years, for centuries, for millennia. And now what is it that human beings, because we've harnessed the laws of nature, what do we get to do? We get to look at that. And who gets the glory for it? Yes, we harnessed the law of nature, but it just gave us a greater glimpse into who our God is. Animals don't do this. 
our efforts are tainted by sin. We know that. But they are not fruitless. See, here's the key in this. If we are God's representatives on earth, that means that we should use the earth the way that God would. I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves as Christians. Do we or should we use the earth the way that God would? Should we steward the earth? Subdue doesn't mean destroy. Y'all can see this differently than me, okay? A while back, I watched a documentary, and it was on coal. Nothing wrong with coal. Coal is something that we should use. It's in the earth. But for uh, hundreds of years, man would dig into the earth and take coal out so that it could be used. Recently in West Virginia, they've done something to where instead of going in and mining the coal, you know what they do? They go and they level entire mountains. Just totally, there was a mountain there, and that mountain is gone because they leveled it to get the coal out of it. You might disagree with me on this, but I don't think that's what God had in mind when He was talking about subduing the earth. Right now, again, I'm just getting us to think here. Right now, there is... A, they call it the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And there are two of these in the Pacific Ocean. Two huge patches of garbage, mainly plastic because plastic doesn't disintegrate. Twice the size of Texas floating in the Pacific Ocean. And, and some of that ends up uh, harming and killing the wildlife that's there. Now, I'm not saying... <laughs> In, in, in any way that we ought to be crazy about this, I'm just saying as Christians, we need to ask ourselves the question, what does it mean to wisely steward the earth that God has given us? Y'all might think I've gone to kissing trees, kissing frogs, being a tree hugger, whatever. I think that it's wise for human beings to recycle so that those things aren't then put into the sea and into the earth to where they don't disintegrate. Re remember when God created, there was no plastic. That's something that man harnessed and created. And it's something that can cause harm to the creation that he has given us. We need to be good stewards. Recycle, replant, harness. Now, the balance in this is, there are some people who get way far off on this, and they think that the concerns of nature ought to trump human concerns. That's not what God meant either in this. We have to be careful to be balanced in that. A pink-footed swamp cricket shouldn't keep humans from responsibly building good homes because there's a little bit of a wet area over there. There's no such thing as a pink-footed swamp cricket, I don't think. But those, those animals that tend to hold those things up are something that you've never heard of. This is just for us to sit back and to think, God gave us responsibility for this. How do we use this ultimately for His glory. The greatest thing in this that we can do is to wisely and prudently uh, steward what God has given us. We will fall short. We will fall short in the way that we treat other image bearers of God. Brokenness that Jason was talking about in Sunday school. Uh, we will fall short in that we will live selfishly, that we will break God's law, that we will sin. We will even fall short in our stewardship at times. I'm grateful though that even though sin has marred the image of God in man, that the reason Jesus came was to restore that image. We're going to see when we get to Genesis 3 that there was a curse that was put on man because of sin. There's a curse on the earth. And Romans chapter 8 tells us in two different places, first of all, that Jesus came to reverse that curse that all of creation is longing and groaning for the day that God comes or that Jesus comes and he puts everything back right. Well, everything is going to be put back right because he came as a human and he lived among sinners. He took on our sinful form, not sinning himself. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. And now what he is able to do, having ascended into heaven, he is able to forgive your sin because he paid for your sin. And He is able to begin to, the Scripture says, to sanctify us. 
And to sanctify us means that he is making us more and more like him. And the goal of every believer should be to be more and more and grow more and more like Christ till the day that we see him, as we sang this morning, and come thou fount, to the day that we see him, his lovely face, that we are freed from sinning at that point. So the, we were made in the image of God. Man mars the image of God. But Jesus comes back. Or Jesus comes and he makes it possible for the image of God to be restored in man. I love the way Romans 8, 29 puts it. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. You know what? Man was made perfect and innocent. And the day is coming when we see Jesus that we are going to be restored to his image. And I'll tell you, as a church, I'll tell you... Uh, Small C church, I'll tell you, big C church, our primary responsibility, yes, is to subdue the earth, to have dominion over the earth, but now that sin has entered into it, our primary responsibility is to find other image bearers of God who have been marred by sin and to bring them to the point, by God's grace and power, to where they believe in Jesus who can reverse the curse and the image of God in man can be restored to what it was meant to be. That is our primary calling. That is our primary goal. Total redemption is coming. And after days like yesterday, after we bury one of our saints, I look forward more and more to the day that that total redemption comes. That Death is swallowed up in victory. That the sting of death is forever removed because of the work of Jesus. One final thing that we see in this is man was created, uh, man's creation was personal, man's creation was patterned, man was created for a purpose. And then the final thing that we see in this is that man was created to pause. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the hosts of them, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. That means he set it aside because on it, God rested from his work, uh, rested from all the work that he had done in his creation. There's one more day that's recorded here. It is the seventh day. And it is said that God rests here. God didn't rest because he was tired. God rested because he is setting a precedent for us. This word rest means to cease from work. And there is an idea, you see this especially here, there's an idea of ceasing from working and then evaluating that work. Isn't that what God does here? He rests, he looks at creation, and what does he say? It's very good. I like it. It's, it's good. It is really good is what God is saying in this. He set that seventh day aside. That means that he made it holy. Yes, it is for rest. We need it, and we see this later on when you get into the law and then in other places, that God created us not to go seven days a week, but to have times of rest. But there's more that we see in this principle of rest on the seventh day. First of all, we see in this that we pause to reflect. It's good to pause and think about the previous six days. Just like God did here. You know, it would, it would change... I think the way that we approach a lot at life a lot, if we were to take time on Sunday, is we, we cease from work. If we were to sit back and look back over the previous week and ask ourselves some questions. Was that very good? Was that for the glory of God? Were, were, my, were my talents and my time used in a way that, that honors me as His image bearer? 
Were my talents and my times used to bring other image bearers to the point to where the image of God could be fully restored in them? Was what we did good? Did we steward it for God's glory? I think it's also a good point for us to sit back and realize the book of Hebrews tells us that the concept of Sabbath rest was originally taken by God when he sat back and looked at his work. But there's a spiritual element to it as well in that from the time man sinned, man was doing everything that he could to get back to God. Man thought that he had to earn God's favor in some way. But when you get to Hebrews chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 4, great reading for this afternoon, we are told that there is a rest for the children of God. And it's not a physical rest. It is a spiritual rest where we have ceased from trying to earn God's favor and we simply rest and look back at what he has done. And we depend on that. And we trust that. Whatever day of rest you take, this is a good thing to do for us to pause and reflect. And then it's also good for us to pause and worship. Later on, God would take this rest. By the way, this word rest is interesting. It's uh, sabbat. That's where we get our word Sabbath. God would later take this day of rest and tell man to cease activity and to use that day for worship. We're not under the Jewish law, so we don't worship on that seventh day, but we do take a day and we set it aside primarily for ceasing from what we've done, reflecting, and then worshiping God. If we do that every day of the week, we are doing something that is so important. We are reorienting ourselves every Sunday around our number one priorities. Reflecting God as his image bearers. Bringing other image bearers back to God. So what does this mean for us? There are, just to kind of summarize these things, there are three things that we can take home as believers from this that are really important. The first thing is this. It is that we should, I think my remote is uh, dead wit, there we go. Remember that your neighbor has the Imago Dei. You have the Imago Dei, the image of God. But your neighbor also has the Imago Dei. Love them as you love yourself. Remember who they are. And when you remember they have the Imago Dei, It's going to change the way that we view life before birth. It's going to change the way that we view life in later stages. But it's also going to change the way that we interact with people. And the way that we talk to them and speak to them. Not making them enemies, but loving them as our neighbor. So we first of all, remember that the neighbor or your neighbor has the Imago Dei. The second thing is that we should remember that we are stewards of the earth for God's glory. He put us here for dominion. He put us here to subdue, but he put us here as image bearers to do that. His representatives on this earth. We give glory to God when image bearers subdue. And we also seek, now that creation has been marred by sin, we also seek to bring the rule of Christ to the hearts of men so that they can be restored. And then finally, we should remember to pause. We should remember to pause just like God did. God did this, so can you. God ceased from his work and evaluated. We can as well. And then we not just cease to evaluate, we cease from work so that we can worship. Worship the Creator. Remember what he made us for, for his glory. If you don't mind, heads bowed, eyes closed. This is going to unfold the idea of the image of God being marred. See, it's going to unfold as we continue. See, when God created us, yes, able to 
intellectually reason. When God created us with moral reasoning, it wasn't corrupted by sin. And now that moral reasoning is corrupted by sin. It can actually become so corrupted that we see what is wrong and we call it right. And we see what is right and we call it wrong. And every person here, while you were made in the image of God, that image has been marred because you were born a sinner just like I was born a sinner. Jesus came to take the penalty for that sin. He died in your place. He took the punishment that you were due. He took the punishment that I was due. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 puts it this way. His goal was to reconcile us to God, whereas sin had driven us away from God. Jesus brings us back because the sin has been paid for. If you have never trusted Christ, it's not just that the image of God is marred in you. It means that you were broken as a human being. And that your sin has separated you from God spiritually right now, but it will separate you from God spiritually for all of eternity. And that doesn't have to be the case. You heard me talk about us being ambassadors <laughs> to, to show how we can be brought back to God, how we can uh, begin to be on that path of being restored to the image of God by the work of Jesus Christ. That can happen to you. Scripture says that if y'all... <laughs> Scripture says that when somebody puts their faith in Christ, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, the new has come. The moment you get saved, God takes that sin. He gives you His goodness and righteousness. And He begins His work of conforming you to the image of Christ, the perfect man. If you've never trusted Christ, I would urge you to do that today. Talk with me afterwards. Let me take the scripture so that you can show how you can know that your sins are forgiven. How you can enter into rest, not trying to earn salvation yourself, but trusting Jesus and Jesus alone.